So I am sat here today with this beautiful double bass by Giovanni Dollins. Uh, he was a maker from Trieste. Uh, he was born in 1802 and he died in 1857. Um, he's considered the finest uh, of the Trieste makers. Um, I, I would certainly agree with that. Um, and this double bass is probably, you know, I'd say some of his very, very finest work. Um, Trieste is a small region in the north of Italy. It's basically almost straight across the water from uh, Venice. Uh, and he worked there as a double bassist actually until I think 1853 uh, in the Civic Orchestra of Trieste. Uh, he was a bassist there and uh, obviously a very fine maker. Um, and I think with his work, you really see uh, a progression. Um, so we had a fairly large output of, of instruments, actually, what, which is pretty something pretty amazing, considering he was working as a double bassist at the same time. Um, the early instruments, uh, sort of around 1830, um, 1835, um, are not the greatest of violin making, uh, and the varnish can be quite dark. Um, and it's sort of his late, later time, uh, 1845, 1850, there's some absolutely magnificent uh, instruments. Um, <clears throat> and they're very distinctive, similar like this bass, the proportions of it, and things like the sound hole placement and style. Um, and I would say with Trieste, it was obviously very heavily influenced by Venice. Um, and it also, I think there's definitely a sort of a heavy influence of Cremona too. So you kind of get a wonderful... Uh, mix up of um, these uh, different styles um, and this particular bass uh, is, a, is a really really fine example made about 1850 um, if you look there's a number of cellos that were made around the same time and they are so so similar. Double basses from Giovanni Dollins are quite rare um, his son Giuseppe uh, made a number he obviously learnt from his father and um, again was made plenty of instruments. I think the quality is not quite as nice um, and there's a number of double basses, some of which have carved sort of animal uh, figures on the heads um, and uh, yeah, Giuseppe again still a very good maker but I think this really is the sort of the dual double bass from that family's uh, output. So if we look at this particular instrument you'll see the front is magnificent. You know, the Italians, wood was obviously a, a premium then um, to get tone wood. You know, someone had to go into a forest, chop, chop the tree down with an ax. They had to drag it out with a pony. Then it had to be sawn up by hand. So, I mean, it really was um, a big labor to get materials at that time, especially for a double bass, because they're extremely large. So you can see this has got wonderful, four pieces of wonderful uh, half slab cut spruce. Um, so it's probably four sort of fairly decent boards uh, would have been sawn through and through, so not quarter, quarter sawn like we you would use today so much. Um, four large chunks. He obviously had a fairly decent uh, depth as well because this has quite a nice full arch on it. Um, but it's gorgeous, you know, slab cut wood. We don't really use it so much these days, but at those times, um, possibly they used it for styling. But I think a lot of it was just that was the materials available you know, in the length to do a bass. And you've got to think that if there was a piece, a piece of really top, top tone wood to make a bass from, well, you could also make eight violins out of it. So, uh, but now, I mean, this type of wood is just has so much character. Um, I think it's absolutely beautiful. And now some Dolin's instruments, particularly some of his later cellos, the sound holes appear a little bit, like they're almost a bit far in, uh, and they're quite small in proportion. And this again, it's quite a good example of that. Um, they appear like they're quite far in again because it's actually got a fairly narrow waist. Um, and I think the, 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 the sound holes are kind of a bit Cremonese actually in their style um, and absolutely beautiful. Uh, no fluting down the wing, um, absolutely typical. Very, very little purfling channel. And actually you'll see on the shape again, uh, it's got quite a full uh, bottom and it's very, very intentionally for the time actually becomes quite a lot narrower at the top. Uh, and again, the cellos uh, are very similar. Um, and all they've done is kind of 
stretch the shape to be able to create a base. Um, and I think it's an absolutely gorgeous, very elegant model. Um, so if we look at the rest of it, so if we start with the back, the back is two pieces of, again, sort of half slab cut uh, fruit wood, I think probably cherry. Um, it's actually very difficult to see. You can see, well, you might be able to see this. Actually, it sort of runs to slab in the middle of these two pieces, and it's got a couple of wings uh, at the bottom. And uh, typical uh, of Venice, actually, at this time, you'll see the break is very low. Uh, that's really uh, for old bases, um, where I think you sort of almost exclusively see this very, very low break. Um, Venetian instruments often have tapering ribs, very low break. Um, but this is less so the tapering ribs, but this break is wonderfully low. I mean, that's even lower than we would put it today, which I think actually really helps the playability of this bass because it's, um, you know, it's a fairly large model. Um, uh, the ribs, again, beautiful slab cut uh, fruit wood. Um, it's again, probably cherry, I would say. Um, absolutely gorgeous uh, wood. And uh, interesting, it's got a lovely little uh, carved, um, carved leaf motif here, um, almost a bit like a fleur de lis, but kind of, um, sort of, sort of some, some leaves. Uh, and this is original with the base. Um, it really feels sort of right. And I think it also links into uh, his son had some carved heads and things. I think they weren't afraid um, of this. Um, which I think is a lovely touch. The purfling follows it around, you know, all together. I mean, the, the bass is phenomenal. Um, and you'll, there's a video of Tom playing it and you'll hear it's got sound to match. I mean, it's really perfect, I think. So if we have a look at the head uh, of the bass, again, made of uh, fruit wood. I'll move it here so you can see it. Um, and again, this is actually pretty Venetian in its style. Uh, and again, maybe a bit Cremonese around the back here. It's Venetian in the way it's been set back, but it also has a sort of Cremonese feel, which I think is the vibe uh, that I certainly get from Dolins. Um, you know, it's sort of late Cremonese, or cross Venetian, which kind of makes sense for where he was and, and who would have been influencing people at that time. Um, and quite unique uh, is this closed teardrop here. We see this with English bases. You see it sometimes with Italians as well. Um, you know, that could almost be a bit Cerruti-ish. And uh, again, cellos, the Dolin's cellos have this. They also have quite a clubby feeling bottom to the peg box to me. Like this feels a little bit, I don't know, kind of clubby and uh, less refined than some uh, instruments. It also has a very, very small uh, throat here. Uh, and actually quite a round uh, volute. Um, uh, again, beautifully carved, uh, very typical of Dolins. Um, so yeah, that's a quick look at the, the base um, and a few thoughts about the maker. Um, it really is something special, you know. We're Italian bases, we're sort of finding this with our research for the Italian double bass book we're doing at the moment. They are so rare uh, compared to other instruments. Um, you know, they were so big, there was war going on in Italy, there was woodworm, there was hot, there was damp, there, you know, the, the conditions for double bass survival uh, with woodworm and, and everything else in Italy were, um, you know, not great if you were a bass. So um, these fabulous instruments are so rare and this is a really, I think, uh, phenomenal instrument uh, and whoever ends up with this is going to be extremely lucky.